This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists to inform and to entertain. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast misadventuring into the archives of medical history and beyond. Each show, we dissect a history of medicine topic from the past to learn a little something about how medicine got to be the way that it is today. I'm Dr. Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Aaron. Hey, do you? And Dr. Mike. Yo, what's up? As well as our medical history intern, Alba. Hello, Alba. It's a me, Alba. <laughs> I'm trying to get weirder. Okay. <laughs> Every time. But you know, yeah, she gets to yeah, she gets to read the room and then have an appropriate response. <laughs> I don't think Aaron's that's why got the toughest luck. Yeah. I don't think that's why she went. Yeah, middle's hard, yeah. Anywho. Well, guess what, guys? We we have to start out again by thanking a few patrons and welcoming them to Woo-hoo! the Poor Historians Podcast House Staff. These folks have decided kindly to support our show and we are very appreciative of them doing so. So I want to say thank you real quick to new member uh, intern level, Tyler. Can I get a thank you for Tyler? Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Tyler. Thanks. Tyler. Thanks. And I also have to say a really nice thank you to the newest member of the team of fellows we have here at the Poor Historians Podcast House staff, and that is Jessica. Jessica. Let's get a, something yeah, for Jessica. Jessica. Thanks. So we got enough fellows now to cover Q24 hour call. That's great. Good job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That means you are on call every 24 hours or every, what, every other day, right? Actually, yeah. Q1 day call is what it would be. Yeah. Right? Welcome to your weird medical history training, but uh, we really appreciate you guys joining the team and uh, everything like that. It's uh, really cool to have folks signing up. And if you also want to join our strange and unusual house of medical history, check our links to our Patreon account, the Patreon account in the show notes, but we can't leave our newest Patron members, our intern, our fellow, without some words of advice. So I'm, I'm going to say that uh, we're going to have to get a good pep talk from Aaron this show. Aaron, what words of advice do you have for, for patrons? They can't see your startled look because you didn't know I was going to ask yeah, you that. Yeah, I mean, got to go with the classic. Uh, don't check temperature, can't find fever. There you go. <laughs> I think we're we're going to start to worry. If you can't some of our listeners. Pulse, just go. <laughs> 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 also, if you're a fellow, uh, you get a complimentary jumbo bottle of ProVigil to okay. be used uh, without the knowledge of any staff. Yeah. All right. Is that no? That's not our policy. It's definitely not our policy. No. No. Well, Viagra. It's not. Can we do Viagra? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that medicine is. What is it? ProVigil is a. Uh, it's a prescription stimulant. Um, to increase attention, but it's narcolepsy. It's like a narcolepsy. It's, it's a narcolepsy. Yeah, that's the on-label use is narcolepsy. I've never seen a narcoleptic on ProVigil. Well, it's pre-narcolepsy because you have not yet fallen asleep. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. All right, yeah, well, not great. Moving right along, let's uh, let's jump to the next segment, which is Mike's trivia. Mike, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I right, failed well, miserably the last time. I wasn't even close. I couldn't even say the word right. Well, I, I was like, I don't want to make you extra nervous, but this is one that is a potential could get. I'm not saying it's easy necessarily, but I am saying it is a potential. You might, this might be known. So I'm not saying I would get it without goal. looking it up, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm a little worried. This might actually <laughs> be one of the, to the ones. Right. <laughs> so before Six we get to the main the part board. of the show, we're going to do Mike's trivia segment. And this is the part where you send us, uh, an audience member sends us a medical history trivia question, and we pose it to Mike to see if he knows the answer without any preparation at all. And if he gets it wrong, the listener is awarded a contrived medical eponym in their honor. If he does happen to know the answer, the opposite of that happens. How many times has that happened so far, Elba? Zero. Oh, that's right. That's right. I, that's, but it is. I'm going to send I my own one I think it's this time, in. though, Mike. I think, I, I think you're going to get it this time. I don't know what it is, but I believe in you. Okay. I, I feel right. like you do know what it is. I feel like you do know what it is now. I don't. I know I don't. I just nope. believe in Mike. All right. So the asker of this question is Kristen. And Kristen asked, which physician invented the stethoscope and in what year? Oh, it was Dr. Littman. <laughs> Dr. Littman. <laughs> he worked with Dr. Marquette. So Dr. Marquette was um, a pioneer in AI reading EKGs. 
uh, it was three physicians together. It was Einthoven, Littmann, and Marquette. And that was mm. Einthoven's triangle. And they Are you um, spitting all over your microphone? <laughs> I just swallowed a non-alcoholic beer. So uh, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Littman, what year? The Correct, what year? 17, 1793. Hmm. Dr. Littman. The Littman 1 came out in 1793. The Littman uh-huh. 2 came out in 1869. <laughs> That's great. I'm still Littman using three it. Came still out. using it. We're only on the Littman 3, right? Or 4? <laughs> Oh, you know, I honestly don't you can still know. Get it too, I think the med students well, have fours. Here, here's oh, they always that, overspend. So that's wrong for to answer this question, but it is definitely the maybe the most recognizable uh, company name that makes stethoscopes. So Lippmann <laughs> stethoscope did you like is the legendary. Eindhoven's triangle. I did, I did like, like the Eindhoven's was... triangle, which right. Eindhoven was the uh, the the guy who basically figured out how uh, that the heart conducted electrically and was able to make like the first EKG readings of the heart. So it, that was a nice, that was a nice, it was not part of this at all, but it was a nice reference. I did appreciate that. So the actual answer John Stone. is <laughs> Dr. Rene Linnaeic. Oh, Linnaeic. First, yeah. He created the first version of the stethoscope in 1816 out of a rolled up paper tube, which he held between his ear and the patient's chest. This patient, I thought you were going to say a young woman. Not a stethoscope. <laughs> That's not. Like he doesn't a cup get on credit for that. You have to let me finish. I will. I will. So this is a modesty you... thing, wasn't it? So he didn't put his yeah. ear on her chest. So basically, he thought it was weird because what physicians used to do is just put their ear on the chest to listen to the heart, and uh, he was like, uh, "That's weird me out because it's a young lady. I want to. I want to keep a little distance." And so he. Well, in a, I'm going to I'm going to prefer to think he was very non creepy and meant well with this. So he rolled up a piece of paper. He listened to the chest and it led to him making a more refined version of this. He called it the stethoscope uh, from the Greek meaning stethos, meaning chest and scopian to mean to view or see. And since you don't look down a stethoscope to see into a chest, I think the name is kind of in retrospect, silly, just if I could give mm. notes. But that was in 1816. I may have said before, and I have another fun fact about famous stethoscopes. My former Littman three, which was my former primary stethoscope that I used to use in the previous practice, uh, now resides in the collection of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, because our friends who were on the show a couple of years ago reached out to me and said, hey, what what would be the like just general modern stethoscope to like put in a display. I was like, Oh, you just like a Littman, whatever, get a cardiology three is a pretty popular one. They're like, okay, how much is that? I was like, I mean, I'll give you mine for free. I have multiple stethoscopes. And, uh, and so it may, stethoscopes. it may or may not be on display at the museum. I don't know for sure. Cause I just haven't been there yet. It's in Frederick, nice. Maryland. So if we have any listeners who are at Frederick, Maryland and you go, to that museum, which sounds like a really cool museum run by really cool people, of course. Uh, take a picture. If I, my stethoscope is there and you send me a picture electronically and you're the first one to do it, I, I, I got an idea. I got a little prize for you. So there you go. You should have sent him your mustache. Mm. <laughs> Last time I did that, though, I ended up on a list and I don't want to. And then I have, have to wait for it to grow back. Don't mail a mustache. Don't mail a mustache. Don't. That that's a great segue for what we'll talk about in the Patreon episode. I, I just realized that. <laughs> Anywho, all right. Well, there you go. So, um, Kristen, it sounds like you you have an eponym heading your way, and since my job of reading them was wrenched away from me violently in the last episode, we'll go ahead it's and mine now. Give the, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Alba. Go for it. Kristen, your eponym is Kristen's retro ocular echo phonograph. If Dr. Lanik thought his fancy chess looking device was fancy, he never heard of Kristen's retro ocular phonograph, which is way cooler because it lets you listen to the back of eyeballs without making contact with the person. If putting an ear to a chest is weird, imagine earing up to a person's eyeball without this fancy device. And whatever you're picturing in your imagination is exactly what the device looks like. But that was whatever good. Mike's picturing awesome. can't say it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. We can misname <sighs> devices too. There you go. All right, Kristen. Hope you enjoy. Go ahead and trademark that as soon as you get those drawings made up. It's got to be long because you know how you get close and then your eyelashes tickle each other and it's like blink, 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 blink. <laughs> yeah. You're listening to their eye, but it's the ear. With the ear. How does your Wait, ear hair back tickle eyeballs. Their- 
Well, it's when a scope, so you get to be looking through it, right? Just like the, the stethoscope. No, it's a phonograph. Yeah, phonograph. it's a retroocular echo phonograph. Look at this phonograph. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect cut to the main segment. All right, guys, this uh, this uh, episode is going to be mine, so I hope you're all ready for a uh, dazzling case. Are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Born ready. Mm. So the case I'm going to present has been excerpted from the University of Maryland's Historical Clinical Pathology, uh, Clinical Pathological Conference, a source we've used in the past. I used for the Edgar Allan Poe episode, uh, and I will credit Dr. Sidney Cohen and Dr. Philip Makoviak, who wrote the presentation that the case was taken from. I think that conference sounds like a lot of fun, and I'm sure the after party mixers are really interesting affairs. So maybe someday we'll get to go to it. I don't know. Does that sound like you're probably kind of a seeing? lot of taper on glasses? Maybe. <laughs> Nerds. But those are my people. So the historical patient in question is pretty well known to most people existing today. He's considered to be famous or even infamous, depending on one's understanding of the word scientific theory. I'm going to take you through an overview of his medical history, his symptoms, and ultimately his death. Spoiler alert, he doesn't make it through the end of that story. Uh, and I'm going to do that as they're presented in the case conference, though I'm going to condense it quite a bit for our show. So many, but not all, of the patient's health issues start after a long 19th century voyage at sea. He leaves England for a five-year working cruise while he was in his early 20s. During that, he visited South America and ended up going across the Pacific Ocean to the Far East and even to Africa. I don't know if they played shuffleboard aboard the ship, but I'm sure they had a good time on said cruise. Wait, no, a five-year working cruise? Five-year working cruise. From New England? Maybe not from a cruise. Old England. Not a cruise. Old England. Is it not a fun cruise? It's a cruise like just you don't know. It wasn't. It's probably fun times. I'm but sure I, there's some fun. Yes, I wouldn't. All right, maybe it's not a recreational cruise. Maybe I right. oversold that experience. But okay. yeah, there might be shuffleboards with pirate dookies on the deck. Is that why they <laughs> call it the poop deck? Because of the shuffleboard. You know, I used to have a sailboat. I, I never looked up why they call it that. We had a mm. I'm not going to do it right now. We had a long argument in a poetry class about whether you could start a poem. I stand on the poop deck of my great sailing ship, and we all said, <laughs> "No, dude." You can't. And he's like, but that's what it's called. And we're like, it doesn't matter. What is the poop deck? Sorry for the. It's like a raised. I don't know. I'm not a sailor. But like there's a like a raised deck, second right? deck or something like there's it's it's, it's a like term. the area. So you can get your butt over the edge and poop in the water. No, it's like it's not related to poop. There's some other thing. But we're like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can't start. It just was associated now with the word poop. Yeah. The also, it's a is, bad line. But whether anyway. or not we know what that word means, it has. It will not help you guys on this story. So that's uh, <laughs> I have right. a feeling Sorry, that was a tangent. That was a tangent. Mm -hmm. All right. So no cruise experience would be complete without some, you know, health ailments, right? Uh, this patient had issues with seasickness, as you might imagine, and had some intermittent fevers as well during this cruise. Uh, those did improve. Two bouts of suspected food food poisoning were thrown in there as well at some point he experienced some swollen and inflamed joints at times uh, he had an episode of heat stroke as well and uh, a bout of so-called chilean fever <laughs> he okay managed to survive the five-year trip at sea to return to england and at that point he seemed overall well one year syphilis not syphilis oh. i'm sure it was on the list honestly there's a lot of things on this list but i don't I don't think that's that's not where we're focusing today. So one year after his return, he had a brief run of palpitations, basically a heart fluttering in the chest kind of sensation. Then apparently not much happened after a year and a half until he had his first attack of gastric flatus, quote unquote. That's how he described it. Uh, flatus <laughs> is that like being he got real farty. Is that what flatus? Well, is? I mean, flatus but is if it's gastric is probably bur burping, right? I mean, or is he just saying gastric as related to the stomach? I think this was like the patient's words because this patient happened to very much document all of his symptoms. And you said so I'm I guessing have gastric he... flatus. Yes. Wow. He, well, I mean, he's in the he's in the 18th century. That was a common word. Well, right? it's flatus For... too, you guys. Flatus. It's flatus. <laughs> so he's just real gassy. Just well, basically, boring. he would use that term to describe having sudden abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and dry heaving. And so you'd mm. have these episodes. They, they kind of occur about three hours after he would eat uh, a meal, especially breakfast. He seemed to have it more when he had stress. And sometimes he would even say, I can't keep any meals down. Uh, the 
uh, the emesis, which is the most polite medical word for vomit we have, contained acid in morbid secretion, quote unquote. Morbid. Uh, like, wait, wait. Uh, acid in morbid, but not morbid? undigested food. Correct. Not secretion? undigested food. Like bile? I, yeah. I, I would guess he's just saying acid, like like bile-y looking stuff, stomach acid, basically. And morbid secretion just seems like a way of saying it looked gross in fancier words. I don't words. know. I wouldn't be able to puke and then look at my puke because if I looked at my puke, then I'd puke again. And then I would just keep puking. Until you don't look I'm... at your puke when you puke? I can't. Mm. I, I, How do you, I'm a you're already puker. puking. I mean, you're lo- you're, or do you do it with your eyes closed? No, I'm sure I've seen the puke like hit the ground or the toilet or whatever oh, but it is, like but I'm not going to like look. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Mm. Was, he, was, he was he tracking the evolution of his symptoms, Max? Uh, he was just tracking his symptoms. I don't know why you bring that up. Apparently, good news is Aaron, his bowel movements were normal and, uh, he had that going for him, which is nice. These attacks would come on and off for the next 30 years of his life. And at least 20 of England's most prominent physicians at the time weighed in on the cause of his illness. Famous guy. The list of possibilities was many, 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 many items long. I'm not going to go into all of them, but, uh, one of my favorites from that list was quote, repressed anger towards his father. <laughs> <laughs> which was followed in the list by lupus. By, hmm. by lupus? That it's was either next... repressed anger <laughs> towards your father or you got lupus. I, I, I like those these two. guys. Yep. <laughs> I, I couldn't help but include that. He would also be treated with like a laundry list of various items at various times. There and some go. of those items could Mercury. actually probably be used to do laundry, honestly, I think. Uh, that <laughs> did include ammonia. Relax. Codeine, mm. arsenic, and a little strychnine for good measure. Oh, there you go. There it is. Uh, these did not relieve his GI symptoms, much to my surprise. So he would develop many other symptoms during his lifetime. I'm going to detail some of them. This is not all of them. <laughs> and so age 29, he frequently had violent heart palpitations. That's his words, violent, not mine. And complaints of headaches. The palpitations return on and again uh, back in the come back to him in his 50s and actually they come on again before he dies in his 70s in his 30s he had episodes of numbness in his fingertips buzzing in the head seeing stars and giddiness with involuntary twitching of his hands 50s and 60s it develops migratory joint pains and low back pains and along the way he had eczema of his skin of his face and boils on his skin at age 57 he had his horse fall on him in fact, that has nothing to do with his death almost two decades later, but they included it in the story and I felt compelled just, to leave it in just because it's this amazing. Is just a guy this writing a down all guy. the stuff he feels. Yeah, no, it's true. It is true. Social history it's is too bad notable. we didn't have Netflix back then. He wouldn't have written any of this stuff. He'd been like, Love is Blind season six. <laughs> I don't get that Are you show. still watching? Watch TV. Five, four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not because my horse fell on me. <laughs> Social history is notable for his work as a naturalist. He smoked cigarettes and cigars, and he liked snuff, all the forms of tobacco. He drank brandy, wine, and port in moderation. And other than those vices, he had no vices. During his final <laughs> decade, his physical health actually seemed to improve, notably uh, that he was no longer having all the vomiting problems. And uh, in his 70s, the first thing that started to go again was his memory, but uh, not enough that he wouldn't go rock climbing, apparently, for funsies. Nice. Mm. Apparently, bro had hella grip strength, I imagine. Did he get During bitten that, by a finch? No. <laughs> God. That's a weird question. Why would you ask that? Yeah. During that time, he had a sudden, quote, fit of dazzling, end quote, which is amazingly vague, and I don't know what that means, and nor does anybody from what I can tell. But that's a cool symptom to describe. He had a fit, fit of dazzling. Of dazzling. Yep. And of, uh, is that like of dazzling or be dazzling? Just dazzling. Just the Mod Podge, like you bedazzle something and you put sparkles oh, all over it. I think all it. of us know what bedazzling is. Well, you saw the infomercial, right? The dazzling episodes happened on and off for the next three months. What or does so. he mean by that? Nobody knows. I don't know. Dazzling. They don't describe that any further. No, they dazzling. don't. Um, it was. I feel like it could be. He like... did have uh, giddiness with irregular pulses. <laughs> uh, does giddiness help you at all? So, no, yes, because it's it in the ICD-10 still. Like it is. I know it comes up. <laughs> Dizzy and giddy. and giddiness. Yeah, that's true. That's I can diagnose people type with giddiness. Dazzling. Yep. Because if you do, if you do dizziness, yeah, then because you have to click all the other things that it could be. So you click dizziness and giddiness. Giddiness comes up because yeah, because it it's just that's the only thing. It doesn't populate more things. I still oh. have this. So d- did he have an affection for beagles? No, this is a dog. We didn't mention dogs at any we're point. On the same, so uh, we're on he the develops same. a cough, which is treated with quinine and subsequently replaced uh, by precordial <laughs> chest pain. 
uh, exhaustion and insomnia for that. He's given amyl nitrate uh, <laughs> for the, and begins vomiting, retching, and has a loss of consciousness. <laughs> Apparently, amyl nitrate is was used for chest pain back in the day. Uh, it's also, uh, in the modern day, more of a recreational drug for me, you know, as a really? popper. Yep. Apparently, oh. apparently, I'm not saying it's the most popular, huh. but apparently it's there. The more you know. Are those those little things that you like pull and they like a little mini firework thing? I hate those things. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, oh, yeah. Kindred spirits. Those things suck. You can get high with one of those? No, don't. <laughs> don't. This is no, I'm not going mouth. to. I, I would never. <laughs> no, hoppers, <laughs> it's just the slang term for amyl nitrate use. Those oh, okay. don't, don't try to inhale firework poppers is a very different thing somebody on the internet has tried Uh, anyway he so he awakens from that episode he drinks some brandy seems (laughs) okay-ish but then he faints trying to get to the sofa the following day unfortunately after another fainting episode he was found deceased the official cause of death at the time was quote angina attacks with heart failure and degeneration of the heart and greater blood vessels i'm gonna wonder Aaron might have a hint, but do you guys know who we're talking about? I have a hint, too. Hmm. We'll let... I don't know. I've already made three guesses as to okay, who this Aaron, is. Okay, Aaron, go ahead. You want to say oh, it? But go he... ahead and say it. No, is it, is it Darwin? Is it Charles Darwin? It is Charles Darwin. Woo-hoo! Yay! That's what I was going to wow. say. Wow. Now, the final cause of Char- Charles Darwin's death, that cardiac-related story, is interesting, but it's not the most interesting part of this. It's not really why I brought this uh, case up. And I definitely don't think that we're going to be able to tie the lifetime of laundry list symptoms all together in a neat package here. <laughs> no. I included them, and I honestly didn't include all of them, but they were very impressive because he sort of compulsively recorded every symptom pretty much that he ever had in a diary and or wrote about it to friends. So Yeah, that's the actual it, pathology. Yeah, yeah, how does he have any time to do any of this other stuff? I, well, he was a, he was at least prolific in his work, so he did manage to to go about that. So, th- I did choose this subject though to bring up the an illness that is specific and suspected to have contributed to that final that, that final condition of his heart that he had, and it's now it's still a, an issue that's a worldwide problem, and I think it needed some in need of some discussion, but. I can't credit myself for coming up with the topic. I have to credit somebody who's kind of one of Mike's people. Uh, Credit goes to our fan, Tara. A bodybuilder? A veterinarian (laughs) from Australia who listens to the show and has a passion for zoonotic diseases. Those are diseases that have a a basis in like animal kingdom. And uh, so she sent us a show idea. And I said, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a good idea. And had to kind of creatively figure out a way to tell the story because the story of its discovery is neat and interesting in a general scientific sense, but there was, I need to dress it up a little bit. I'll explain when we get there. So I will say that Tara did, did mention that she loves our humor, even the dad jokes and the dark humor, but she didn't mention Mike's authentic Australian accent one way or the other. So I, um, <laughs> it's terrible. I don't, she didn't say she, I don't think she commented on it. So Tara, yeah, if you have any her. thoughts, uh, you go she ahead and let me know. It. All right. So I looked into the history of this particular illness and I haven't said exactly she what it is it yet, by Oh, all get right. out of mate. <laughs> Fair dinkum. Putting all the shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> Elba, you, uh, you want to contribute anything? Uh, your, how's your Australian accent? <laughs> That's the dumb and dumber. I That's just dumb and dumber. Get on the barbie. Just a, a crocky. That's not a knife. Well, it was no, nice having really you, Tara, as a fan. I really appreciate it up until this moment. Okay. Wait, but Mike, are you Australian? Mick Dundee? Yes. Because your cousin is, right? He's born in Mike Australia. Mike was born right? in a plane flying no. over Australia, so he says he's Australian. No, oh. born here. <laughs> Mom's Australian. Dad is American. Oh, gotcha. Mm, there you go. But yeah, so I still have extended family in Australia. Mm. We'll have to see where Tyra is from. See there, you lose it. Like I could do like a sentence, and then the second sentence is always going to be just horrific. It's like a Scandinavian. Stick it just, to, yeah, like it just Stick goes to the badly. knife mentions. It's so, hard. I looked into the history of this particular illness. I haven't said what it is yet, of course, but it, and it was neat, you know, but I, the person who discovered it, I couldn't quite figure out a way to make a full episode out of it, which brought me to, to pick who I picked. And naturally that's how I selected Darwin. <laughs> naturally. Nice. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I actually wrote in my nose notes, pause for effect, not thinking somebody would catch that nice. as quickly. And thank you, Aaron. Nice. You're, my, you're, you. you're my favorite person on this podcast right now. <laughs> I didn't even groan. I didn't even groan. I, I forced myself to not even groan. <laughs> you're all welcome. <laughs> I didn't even get it. 
I feel like I'm going to put a pause in there just for the effect. Because he's a naturalist, natural selection. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of ways. No, I get it now. So, Charles Darwin, also known as Chucky D to his friends and colleagues, (laughs) was was... a groundbreaking 19th century naturalist who would go on to describe the process of natural selection and the gradual evolution of species in his epically boring work, The Origin of Species, which I don't know if you've ever read. It is really dry. And uh, I did read excerpts somewhere along the way in college. Yeah, but yeah, it just would have been a quote though. You didn't actually get the book. Oh, we had to read. We had to read like chapters and whole whole parts what? of it. I had yeah, to read part uh, of it biology too. Biology class. Well, it, it might surprise you to find out that uh, Charles Darwin may have been indeed a victim of a little bug bite, which I'll explain. Mm. No, mm. and a little background on the man who was described in the pathology conference source as having a long beard and sunken eyes, giving him the look of quote patriarch of the world end quote. And like, does that make him Daddy Earth? That's <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't I don't know. know. Patriarch, Patriarch of, the of the world. That's um, mm. I don't know about that. Weird. Anyway, at the conferences, hey kids, you want some quarters? Just reach in my front pocket. <laughs> and shake oh, them around. Weird. Darwin was born in a town that <laughs> has uncle. to be quaint That's the because it's called the world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Sorry, never go mind ahead, the Max. one take. Captain Come Planet on. was his illegitimate child. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep. Darwin was born in a town that has to be quaint because it's called Shrewsbury in England in 1809. And there's a place in Australia called Darwin. Darwin? Mm. It's a city. No, that's, a, that's probably in Massachusetts, honestly. <laughs> his father was a physician and may have wanted little Charlie to follow in his footsteps. The Chuckster did enroll in the University of Edinburgh, scotland at age 16 but ultimately did not finish his journey in medicine apparently he became queasy at the sight of blood which i would think would make for a very tough career in this business Mm -hmm. fortunately he had a penchant for studying the natural world so he went ahead and did that instead his most notable boat trip was a five-year voyage at sea as a naturalist on the hms beagle weird that aaron mentioned that earlier i think (laughs) the main purpose of this trip was to chart the coast of south america Charles was not known to be a cartography enthusiast, though, because maps were not as exciting as counting birds and collecting rocks. So he did that instead while he was on board. That was his job. He went on to realize that animals would pass on certain genes to their offspring more often if uh, those genes and the effects that they had on the species were particularly well suited to the environment, hence being naturally selected. And he stirred up some controversy as well. That still follows his name to this day when he published The Origin of Species, which suggested that species could evolve over time due to natural selection and observed that the Earth had to be more than 6,000 years old. Now, these bits were definitely controversial for the time, and apparently large segments of society still hold a grudge against the eminent scientists for, you know, being correct. Darwin himself once wrote about science, quote, don't hate the player, hate the game. (laughs) it's in the foreword of the origin of species go look it up it's Mm -hmm. there Mm -hmm. darwin was a curious observer of just about anything in the natural world and was certainly well suited for this voyage on the hms beagle but there was speculation that an illness that he suffered during it might have actually had to do with his death many many decades later so while he's on the beagle he was struck with frequent seasickness which at one point was accompanied by fevers in 19, or 1834. This caused him to be waylaid in Chile, that Chilean fever I mentioned before. And typhoid was a suspected culprit at the time, but this will be kind of the, this, this uh, discussion will be a possible alternative to that. So I mentioned he was into collecting things, including rocks, animals, and bugs, including a curious little beetle looking bug that likes to feed on blood. And according to one source, Darwin would sometimes let one or more of these little guys uh, about the size of a penny, have some of his blood. And I find that weird for what that's worth. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, that's risky. That's what, are you, what are you doing? Well, <laughs> apparently some of the others on the ship, like some of the officers and other sailors, would keep these same bugs as pets because I imagine they're profoundly bored and lonely <laughs> at sea for way too long at this point. Wilson! <laughs> Indeed. Somebody steps on your bug. Do you guys know what that little bug was? Oh my gosh! Did they uh, did they kiss? Come on, it's a little bug that lives in. Yes, they did. Oh my gosh! Yep. So these men and Darwin were all keeping triatomine bugs as pets, and they are also known as the reduvid bug. 
Yes. Uh, blood sucking bugs and everyone's favorite, what Aaron just said, the kissing bug. Because they have a, a habit of affectionately crawling out of cracks, roofs, and crevices at night and eating the blood from your face while you sleep. <laughs> You'll mm. yep. find them distributed all over South and Central America, but don't worry about it. They have started to make their way into the Southern U.S. as well. No, what? what? Oh, we have them here. We have them here. Yep. Yeah, they're they're around. They look like they're kind of like uh, their butt's bigger than their head and they got a little snout. <sighs> yeah, they're, why, would they, why would they want them as pets? Well, I mean, they're on a ship for way too they're long. They're slow and they're moving, and they bored. don't they don't like attack you when they you're awake. Eat your face. <laughs> they don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, they've probably like three books in existence that are on the ship. What else are they going to do? And they're like all sharing those. They have to do something. So you grab bugs that are your fo- you're finding in the wilderness, and you bring them on board. You name them. You pet them, and you feed them your blood. Alba, that's what you do. <laughs> all I'm saying is, I need my face. Well, they they only do it. They typically feed when you're sleeping there. Right. So, well, yeah, you, you don't even know they're there. Correct. <laughs> you're correct. sleeping. Now, the kissing bug is also known to medicine because of a little parasite that it sometimes carries, a protozoan called Trypanosoma cruzi. Picture a microscopic leech-bodied little thing with a little wriggly tail on one end swimming around your bloodstream, like you know, millions and billions of them or whatever, causing all sorts of problems and. If you're exposed to that protozoa, you run the risk of contracting Chagas disease, which it is suspected might have something to do with Darwin's death. Chagas disease, I think, has one of the best just general names, right? It's just a good, solid name. That's a good name. Yeah, it almost sounds like it should be an acronym. (laughs) It does sound that way. Now, so when Tara sent us the recommendation, it was like, we should talk about Chagas disease because it is a world is now a worldwide problem and it causes a significant amount of morbidity and mortality. I was like, that is great idea. Let me look into how it was discovered. And there's a cool story, but like there wasn't a ton of, well, I'll get to it. So what is Chagas disease? I am able to tell you because thanks to the work of its discoverer, the Brazilian physician, Dr. Carlos Justiano Ribeiro Chagas, who is credited with pretty much every bit of everything we know about the disease from his work back in the early 20th century. And not only did he describe the first diagnosis of the disease, again, that's caused by that trypanosoma protozoa from the kissing bug. He identified the protozoa itself, its life cycle. He figured out what animals hosted. He described all the physical ailments that came from the infection. He tracked the epidemiology of the illness, and he even identified prophylaxis and treatment options for this one illness. Like he is the guy who did it all. He did all the things, so it's very fitting to name this potentially life-threatening illness after him, I I think. I, it's a weird thing that physicians do, to be honest. I would want something nicer to be named after myself. I don't know, but do you think that that's, uh, and maybe you came across this, but do you think he named it, or do you think somebody named it for Good question. Him? I, I don't know. I, you know. I don't know. I probably could have come across it, but I didn't stick in my head. But it is one of those things. Let's say he did not name it after himself. Like if you're, if I'm your colleague, Mike, and you discover discover something weird, <laughs> if I name it after you and it's a disease like this, it's, it's because I'm having fun with you, right? Like it's, yeah. Like I'm going to rename Peyronie's disease for you. <laughs> no. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> Elba, don't Google that right now. I don't. Cause I, I, I well, now I have to. It's, it's not you. It's, it's in the news lately. Uh, There's a lot of ads is it really? asking. Yeah. Somebody, some pharmaceutical company or device manufacturer has a new way to treat it. Hmm, interesting. How, how, did, how did I know that, that it would be something like this, <laughs> I, You know, I, I'm, I Leave think I Leave it to the listener's yet. imagination. Click on images. No. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Oh, sorry so, about the sidetrack. Now, I did start the research for this topic thinking I'd just make it about Dr. Chagas, right? I started reading about him, about his discoveries, about how he's an excellent researcher and pioneer within tropical disease. I read about how he was came from modest, like born on a coffee farm beginnings in Brazil in 1878. He gets his medical degree in 1903. He goes on to have a brilliant career in public health. He served as the physician for the Ministry of Public Health and Hygiene in Brazil, including even implementing programs to control malaria and in, in battle the infamous influenza pandemic of 1918. He does all that stuff, but this is poor historians. Boring. So I was looking for <laughs> controversy or intrigue or something unusual or insidious. And the only thing I could really find there, uh, or there wasn't much, but I did find that 
Okay. He might have been spurned out of a Nobel Prize twice. What? Which is kind of fun. I, I didn't know if I could out? make the entire episode about it. So Chagas was, Dr. Chagas was nominated in 1913 by a scientist uh, in Brazil as well named Paraja de Silva, who, as far as I can understand it, actually nominated Chagas, like to spite another guy he was mad at. And so this other guy was studying schistosomiasis, a parasitic worm. And there was this argument between De Silva and like this guy, like about which egg morphology he might, he might have discovered a new egg morphology. And the other guy was like, no, you didn't. Those are just immature eggs. And there's a lot of angry letters go back and forth about worm eggs. And, and then he was like, fine, I'm going to nominate Chagas. And I'm just saying I'm here for that kind of scientific pettiness. And so <laughs> Dr. Chagas gets the nomination after that whole back and forth argument, but then he lost to a guy who did a bunch of work on anaphylaxis. So boo that. In 1920, he was nominated again. But apparently at that time, tropical medicine was out of vogue. And so the Nobel Commission just didn't award anyone the prize uh, in medicine or physiology. And uh, it went unclaimed. But there's also a suggestion that since Dr. Chagas was from South America and the whole Nobel Committee was like way European, there might have been a little bit of cultural bias, but hard to prove. So unfortunately, Dr. Chagas was never awarded a Nobel, though I think he probably deserved one, especially if they didn't give it to anybody. Come on, man. <laughs> like we give it to nobody instead of you. Yeah, Where was he in brave. 2020? We could have used him. I'm just telling All you. Right. He, this guy was a, he, I mean, he truly was a pretty incredible researcher and like very thorough. And so got to give, got to give that bit of his due. But the way that I kind of go about finding episodes, especially if you give me something like a disease, like my brain is like, let's find somebody famous who is associated with it or died from it. So I put that in. And what do you, what do you know? I end up with this story about Charles Darwin. Do they do, do they do an autopsy? They did not. And there were efforts to try and get remains to do genetic testing on it. But the, I don't know, was it the estate or whoever hangs on to Charles Darwin's remains said no. Hmm. Yeah, what's the point? Of, of getting Just, them or holding on to them? Yeah, getting them. Not, not holding on to them. They could do whatever they want with his body. But well, they, they said no. I don't know. I guess somebody's yeah, task for them. them. I agree. Boo. Boo that. Well, you know, it's funny that with the Chagas disease, I know, you know, we had briefly spoken about this a while back and like, I'm just trying to think of all the things that I remember about it. And the only thing I remember is like, I vaguely remembered the bug, mm -hmm. uh, the trypanosoma cruzii and then achalasia is the only other thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I I think that it can cause some other things, but that's and the achalasia only achalasia being. Achal yeah. What's that? It, it might have something and you might touch on this too with this vomiting. That's why I asked about like undigested food. I'll tell you, I'll put the, put the pin in achalasia. I will okay. get to it. I will get to it. So, so one might think that the face blood sucking bite of the kissing bug is what gives you Chagas disease, but it's actually weirder than that. It's actually the bug poo that does it. No, come on now. <laughs> while yes. the bug yeah. is yeah. feeding. Oh, it gets worse. It gets worse. Yep. And while the bug I is. I I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> Alba, you signed on for this. this okay, I can handle it. Go ahead, go ahead. I got my wine. The bug, but take a sip. Uh, while the bug is feeding on your face, as many creatures often do, it has itself itty bitty bug bowel movements. And the bug poo is irritating to your skin, especially while you're sleeping. It makes it all itchy. People often scratch at the face or the site, uh, and they kind of rub the bug poo into their eyes or whatever mucous membrane is closest. Um, you know, that includes nose or mouth and those sort of things. The trypanosoma cruzi protozoa are in that poo, and then they can cross some mucous membranes or in any other area that gives them access to the body, including wounds or like the, you know, that sort of thing. So that's how the infection begins. Are you crying? Don't. No. <laughs> There's maybe, no crying maybe. in medicine. There's no crying. I, I just want to point out you're, you're touching I'm your face a lot. I'm holding myself together. Yeah, I know. I'm, I know. It's because I'm thinking about bugs crawling and rubbing your on eyes. My face. Yeah, like it bites your face and then do poops it. in it. I don't it's know great. what to do. It's... Hands on the desk. <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't know how much more of this essay is going to make you feel better. Um, <laughs> approximately six to eight million people per year worldwide are catch Chagas disease. And actually 50,000 deaths might be attributed to it any given year. It's a really, it's a re very real problem. And now in the age of people traveling all over and the fact that it could remain dormant for really long periods of time, while 
people, you know, travel the globe, catch up, go around, move to other places. Uh, you know, it's much more notable and uh, many more cases nowadays than back in Darwin's time. You can kind of break Chagas disease into two basic phases. There's the acute infection and the chronic infection. So during the acute phase, the trypanosoma parasites are going buck wild in your bloodstream. They're multiplying, they're inflaming stuff. It's like MTV Spring Break 98 all over again. Uh, Aaron was there, weren't you? You know it, man. Panama Beach, right? Front and center. Yeah, that's doing right. Frosted tips. <laughs> yep, frosted tips and all. Nose ring. <laughs> oh, he's frosted all over. Oh, sorry. I couldn't, couldn't resist. Oh, God. I'm getting there too, my friend. So you get the acute infection, and this gives you fevers, rapid heart rates, GI symptoms like anorexia, you know, not wanting to eat, uh, vomiting, and diarrhea. Maybe you get a little liver swelling, maybe a little swollen lymph nodes here and there, a little spleen swelling, uh, and you can sometimes get redness at the bug bite itself. The acute phase can last for weeks to a few months, so that's not fun, a bunch of fevers, etc. And uh, Chagas disease is most treatable if you catch it during this time. But to, to find it, you actually got to take the blood smear and you got to look for the protozoa under the microscope with a special stain. Uh, there may be med students in our audience who can stream that out immediately if they're studying for their boards right now. But I had to read it. It's a uh, GEMSA stain. Remember those hmm. keywords? Yeah, that sounds no. familiar. I, I, yeah, those, step one? It? Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an early medicine boards question that I, I remember the words, but I could not have pulled that out without, uh, without looking it up. Okay, so in really bad cases, which is, I think this was less than 5% of the acute cases, it can give you myocarditis, which is inflammation and swelling of the heart, which is not good. And it can give you meningoencephalitis, which is brain and all the linings of your brain swelling, both of those being bad. But fortunately, with the acute infection, that's going to be very rare. Are you feeling better about that, Elba? Yeah, actually, surprisingly, all the inside stuff doesn't bother me. It's okay. the outside okay. stuff that bothers me. <laughs> all right, good, good. But just imagine, though, there's a, there's a bunch of leech-like little microorganisms swimming around Darwin's blood. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Pooping it's, it's in the, his blood. You know, hey, once it's in there, it's in there. <laughs> I, I think bad, it's the potential for it to get like, in there. She's like, but the bug's sitting out. on his face and pooping. <laughs> mm. Or I've had so much wine that I don't care anymore. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's one. a spirit. <laughs> So 90% of the time, the symptoms do resolve on their own through the acute phase. And actually, 60 to 70% of people never get symptoms, even when the little protozoa are swimming around. So you might not ever know you really have this. A little bit scarier bit, though, 30 to 40% of people infected might go on to develop chronic Chagas disease. And that's the question with Darwin. So chronic Chagas disease is not as rare as I would like to believe even to this day. The estimated global expenditure on this is $647.5 million a year is like the fallout costs for recovering what happens with this disease. And that's almost as much as the Los Angeles Dodgers are paying Shohei Otani in his most recent <laughs> baseball contract <laughs> amount of money. So you have one Shohei Otani of medical expenses. So much money over 10 years. It's insane. I wish I should have been a baseball player, right? Hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody would say that, right? <laughs> Not a lot of five foot six baseball players is a problem. What is it? It's Anywho. 67 mil over? Uh, uh, it's it's like 700 million. Uh, that is a lot. It's a That's chunk. A lot. It's, a it's chunk. inflation. It's a okay. I'd still Ooh. take it. The phase of this illness. It's not about money, Max. It's about <laughs> enjoyment in life. <laughs> 700 million dollars is about money. <laughs> you see, you could be 5'7". If you throw a 120 mile an hour fastball, you could make That's true. That's that true. money. I'm going to start training today. <laughs> the You should get a pre preemptive Tommy John surgery. I should. Just just make like like rookie of the year to make sure those tendons are extra tight. <laughs> like there's a shoulder. Or air bud. No, that was basketball. <laughs> Please write us in and correct us on our rookie of the year versus air bud plot line. We like sports. So we don't care who knows. Yeah. This, so the chronic phase of the illness can last for decades or even a lifetime, basically. Long after the protozoa are gone leaving behind a network of T cells, part of your immune system that are like all confused and releasing a bunch of cytokines and it's doing all this cellular messaging, which I found this one article and I'm going to link it because it was impressively dry and immunology like uh, stuff. But it's kind of cool to say like all these lingering immune system issues might cause the downstream effects. And those effects are specifically on the heart and parts of the GI tract. So chronic Chagas disease can lead to mega esophagus and megacolon 
causing both of these structures to enlarge the mega part, and they lose their ability to move very well. So Mike mentioned achalasia, which is where the esophagus like dilates, right? Doesn't move very well. And so this is kind of a similar, and I, I, I don't know on the spot here if achalasia and mega esophagus are synonymous. I don't know if there's a distinction mm. between them, mm. but you know, in this case Could though- be the same thing. Yeah, I'm I'm just not confident enough to say for sure. But well, achalasia, I think, is like just lesser immobility, mm-hmm. and that could probably cause mega esophagus. Yeah, or mega esophagus could cause that kind of thing. Yeah. So, but you know, what's sort of, and I think Mike honed in on this a little bit earlier. Darwin had a lot of vomiting, and certainly, if your esophagus doesn't move very well, you will have vomiting. But a lot of the food that he had was digested or partially digested. Folks with the achalasia or the esophagus not moving will typically bring up just chewed up but completely undigested food. So that part, not really suspected that it fits. Uh, The big problem with Chagas disease is the heart problems that can come from it. So chronic Chagas disease is a real major worldwide problem because it can cause cardiomyopathy. And that's the term for disease of the heart muscle. And basically, Chagas disease, later in life, your heart can enlarge and it can lose its ability to pump effectively. It can become prone to abnormal electrical rhythms. And inevitably, it leads to heart failure where your heart just falls behind, can't do the work it needs to do. And the only treatment at that point is heart transplant. No medicines are going to, uh, besides you know, medicines to help somebody with congestive heart failure, you can't treat with the antiparasitic medicines you can do in the acute phase. And so this is why it's a problem because you can have it. You can have the acute phase, you can develop the chronic phase and not know it for two to four decades. You know, you move somewhere else in the world and and then, you know, wherever you end up, this this can happen later in life. And that raises the question of, did it happen with Darwin? So if we go back to Darwin, he would go on to have a bunch of episodes of palpitations on and off since he returned from his trip. And to be completely fair, there is one episode of palpitations that was described before he ever got on the boat. So who knows? His final months were notable, though, for symptoms consistent with congestive heart failure. And it's possible that when he was waylaid with his uh, fever and all that stuff in Chile, that's, you know, when he's letting the bugs feed on him and do all that weird stuff, he had a bunch of acute GI symptoms at that time. It raises a question as to whether that was the acute phase of Chagas disease. And then you fast forward to the end of his life with all the extra palpitations, the heart failure symptoms, etc. He could have developed cardiomyopathy. He has maybe those dangerous heart rhythms, which are the violent palpitations he described. And then maybe he ultimately dies because of a combination of these factors. The flip side is the diet of the time was probably like, I don't know, steak and mercury sandwiches with cigarettes and alcohol on the side. So there's a lot of other reasons a guy who's 73 years old at the time could have had heart disease. I don't know. You know, can we attribute everything to Chagas disease? No. That laundry list of stuff I read to you that he was complaining of? No, no no way. Uh, You know, there's no way you can tie all that stuff together. But it's certainly feasible that the end of his life, the ultimate heart failure and death could have come from this, especially since we knew he was playing with this bug so much. I'm just stuck on the fact that the kissing bug causes heart failure. It sounds romantic, (laughs) but it's actually disgusting. Oh, I missed. Yeah. Yeah. Does it lay dormant then? Or are you having symptoms over that? those decades so the the suspicion was it is possible that some of he had intermittent palpitations so maybe he was starting to have some of the early cardiomyopathy changes from the illness it's possible that some of his vomiting issues were because of that but again we're we're working with descriptions that you know there's no physical exam he saw a billion doctors who were putting every heavy metal they could think of into his body you know so how much this was feeding on itself and he wrote down everything i mean he collected all these species he collected all these rocks he did all this meticulous research i think every time he experienced a symptom he wrote it down and so it's really hard to pull a lot of the stuff out from the noise God, could and you so, imagine if he was your patient he just rolls up. No With way. like a big yeah. like three had binders. Yep. Your hand and would like, be on the door partially open. Like, like, ah. Be like, wait, 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 wait. So here, here. Okay. March 25th, 7 a.m. Gastric <laughs> <I> mean, flatus. <laughs> yep. And uh, yeah. I had oatmeal for breakfast. And you're just like, oh my God, just stop. I'm just, just going to get a CT a scan phone. of you. Just, uh, do you, <laughs> I'm going to go. I'll be, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, what's funny though. This is actually my, this is my advice for people. If I don't know what's going on with them, be like, you can keep a diary, you know? So it mm-hmm. does allow for like, if you're able to be a practitioner uh, who sits and spends time looking at patterns, it might help quite a bit. 
I don't know. It seems to fit, Max. That's a cool case. I mean, at least that part seems to yeah, fit. Some other interesting stuff. I, and again, this his list was really big. The Some of the other really interesting leading opinions was, uh, one was Crohn's disease. He could have had Crohn's disease, which would not have affected his heart. But he had some GI issues as a kid. He had them throughout his life. It's possible that he had Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune inflammation of the uh, anywhere, really, in the GI tract that can cause problems on and off on kind of a waxing and waning basis. So that was one interesting. And there was another, as a gastroenterologist, I think it was, uh, I don't have all the sources right in front of me and open, but I think he was part of this conference. If not, he was writing with reference to this. And uh, they even brought up like cyclic vomiting syndrome as a possibility. I was going to say that in the beginning. Yeah, no, I mean, and some of was it was like- pot smoker? I <laughs> uh, did, not that I saw, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, he did all the other- Drugs That'd be cool nitrate. in the diary. Doing poppers. Eight, it would yeah. be cool. eight thirty a.m. Smoked a giant pole. <laughs> I think I mean, to Cypress Hill. Eight forty a.m. Vomited. <laughs> it's exactly. Ten a.m. All finches look the same. <laughs> but I will say Sawed that off shotgun hand on my notebook. <laughs> if the if the best I could do with that was to try to figure out a nice big reference to tie to Chagas disease to kind of raise a little bit of awareness and do do Tara some justice with the suggestion. I hope I achieved that. There you go. Mm. But imagine if this guy walks into your emergency department and he's like, I'm 70, I've smoked cigarettes and cigars my entire life and, and I'm snuff. having chest pain. And it also was in South America 40 years ago. <laughs> and I think like... that I have Chagas disease. You'd be like, we're going to admit you for your bypass surgery. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah, pretty the, much. the steak and the cigars thing. Well, heart, it's a cool case. Well, though. that about does yeah. it. So, Alba, since you are the most polyglottic medical history intern this show has <laughs> ever had... Uh, what, in your opinion, and no, Mike, speaking Australian, does not count. Uh, what, in your opinion, was the most interesting thing from today's tale? Uh, you don't want a bug to poop a protozoa on your face. <laughs> yes. Well said. That's a, you don't, don't let that Get happen. Get a t-shirt of that. Best protozoa quote of the episode by far. All right, well, there you go. So, good general advice. We appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to check our merchandise or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.4historianspod.com. There you can send us messages and find links to our social media sites. We do work to respond to all those posts on those various accounts. If you want to participate in the show, use our site to send us a medical history trivia question. If you're looking for a way to contribute to the show and be a special part of the House of Medical History, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash 4 podcast. A free way to support the show is to tell a friend about us or go and leave a nice five-star review on Spotify, iTunes, or whichever platform you choose. And lastly, if you're a gamer and just want to hang out with me while I'm playing video games, check me out on Twitch via the link in the show notes. Until next time, the poor historians are signing out. AMA. Oh,